All right, we are now live for the AMA session for the day. I'm trying to get everything set up. Uh, I've got to be up here in the upstairs area of our bedroom. You can see the bookshelves a little bit. I see a lot of questions already lined up for me. Um, had to set up the mic that I'll be putting down in just a sec. So doing a lot of multitasking right at the moment. So let me get the questions up for myself and start tackling some of them. Looks like we've already got quite a few. So uh, William Sainkan, uh Pynchon says, how has reading Kierkegaard and James' varieties of religious experience influenced you as a Catholic since they're so big on individualistic faith and not focused on dogma? Well, I don't think that, you know, a, a focus on dogma is something peculiarly Catholic, um, you know, and there's plenty of room for thinkers who are engaging Kierkegaard or James or any other similar people. You know, you might think of, you know, could ask a similar question to Gabriel Marcel, you know, uh, who also was, was uh, within that sort of ex existentialist spectrum and talks a bit about Kierkegaard here and there. Um, I don't know. I, I kind of view it, you know, I'm, I'm sort of Catholic in the lowercase c uh, sense, meaning I'm going to take in everything that I think is particularly interesting and, and worth studying and engaging with, uh, which includes also people like Hegel and Marx, you know, or Nietzsche, um, sort of like, you know, Max Scheler was with, with Nietzsche. And sort of like, uh, you know, thinkers like Thomas Aquinas and, and Anselm were with, with uh, their, their predecessors and interlocutors. So um, I don't see that as particularly problematic myself. Um, I suppose for some people's understanding of what Catholicism, I mean, anytime you talk about Catholicism, you start to lose me anyway, because it's not really an ism. It's a complicated history and body of, 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 you know, literature, some of which is biblical, some of which is, is coming out of that and a bunch of, you know, connections. And then there's something that is very difficult to wrap your head around and, and define adequately uh, that we call a communion, right? Uh, along with uh, all sorts of other interconnected things. So, so for me, it's kind of natural to be looking for whatever anybody has to bring to the table. Um, you know, when it comes to th some of the things where James is, I would say, conditioned by the the social milieu that he's coming out and rather dismissive of what the papists or Romanists might have to say, I just typically ignore that stuff as coming from more ignorance uh, or, you know, his engagement with Catholics of his time uh, and, and an inadequate reading in, say, church fathers or contemporary Catholic literature. I just sort of write that off uh, on that basis. Um, all right, Nicola asks, um, I'd like to ask you the starting question about existentialism. Existence precedes essence if you find time to explain it. Um, well, that's that's more Sartre's formula than, than anybody else's. Sartre's uh, I'll, I'll mention this. So Sartre was the kind of person who, without necessarily intending to, ended up cornering the market on the term existentialism. Because once he came out with that formulation and his particular view on it in existentialism as a humanism, then other important existentialist figures like, um, you know, Martin Heidegger, for example, in the letter concerning human, or yeah, the, what is it? Yeah, the letter concerning humanism. And um, Gabriel Marcel, who'd previously been one of the first people to use the word existentialism in, in French, they dissociated themselves from, from that. Um, so, you know, Sartre's idea, and I think that you can see this going through a lot of existentialist thought, is that First, we exist. That is, a, we surge into being. Existere is not the same thing as esse. And it's not the same thing, by the way, in medieval um, philosophy. Whether it's uh, somebody like Thomas, where there's a strong, you know, uh, well-worked-out distinction between the two, or somebody like Anselm, who uses the term uh, existere differently, that, or existere 
Dancia, uh, uh, Essentia, and Essa, and all that. So the idea is that first we exist, first we live in a world, first we experience things, and then we start to try to make sense out of what it is that we are as human beings. And we are the being, according to Sartre, for whom existence precedes essence. So other things, like, for example, this coffee cup, um, it has an essence. So does the coffee. So does the light that, that you know, I'm shining to have some sort of decent lighting in here. I'll see if I can get it right. There we go. That's a little bit better. So is the microphone that I'm recording on. All of those things have essences. So do my glasses uh, before their existence. But human beings, in a way that's important for our self-identity and thinking about the nature of human potential, um, exist before there's an essence and we choose our essence. So that, that's sort of a thumbnail sketch of that. Uh, we can probably hit on that later. Um, hold on just one second. All right, I just got to try to toggle something here. Um, so, okay, let me take the next question. Oh, Shestoff question. Shestoff in his Athens and Jerusalem says that Hegel's philosophy entirely built on Kant's practical reason, where there is God, immor imm immortality of the soul, and most importantly, free will. Is that true? Well, um, Shestoff is prone to hyperbolic statements. So anytime that you see Shestoff making a very big claim, you probably want to try to think, yeah, is that actually the case? Um, did did um, did Hegel build entirely on Kant's notion of practical reason? No. Hegel is bringing in all sorts of other elements. You could say that Hegel is just as Aristotelian as he is Kantian and going beyond both of them in that respect as well. But it, you could certainly say it's conditioned by it, right? Um, and um, it's, uh, you know, he's, he's working out problematics of, of uh, Kantian practical reason in the very section that we're still, once I actually get myself moving again on it, working on in the half-hour Hegel project, that is the morality section. He, he was discussing that too, by the way, and we're talking about the phenomenology in this case, not like philosophy of right or, or uh, the logic or any of the other stuff, but... Um, he also talked about that in, in the, the reason section with, you know, reason discovering and giving laws to itself as well. But Hegel's going beyond it. Um, and this actually ties in quite well with the next question, which is about Kierkegaard and his critique of Hegel. I think something that's important to remember when you're reading existentialist thinkers like Kierkegaard or Shestoff or, or some of the other people, like Nietzsche is critical of Hegel at certain points, is that um, quite often what they're criticizing is not Hegel as such, but Hegelianism. Hegel had become really one of the dominant philosophical thinkers and thereby approaches in his own time, not just in Germany, but you know in France and England. Uh, he was catching on. There were St. Louis Hegelians here in, in uh, America making sense of the Civil War using Hegel. Um, caught on quite a bit in, in, in uh, Russia as well. And, you know, expositions of a great philosopher are often not quite at the same level. They're often quite simplified. They're kind of dumbed down. And so I think a lot of the Hegelianism of the time kind of fits that, that uh, description. There are some elements of Hegel, uh, Hegel's thought that Kierkegaard is going to take very strong issue with, and so is Shestoff. By the way, um, Shestoff did not read Kierkegaard until I think the 19, 1920s or 1930s, and when he did, he recognized that what he was finding in Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and Nietzsche and Shest uh, uh, Chekhov and people like that was um, also there in Kierkegaard. <clears throat> and, you know, Shestoff himself said, oh, you know, um, I, I recognize sort of a fellow traveler in this. So when they're criticizing Hegel, part of what they're criticizing is this totalizing vision of things where everything has to be understood in terms of the universal rather than the particular. Um, and there's, there's a definite movement, a progress to history. Um, and, and they were, you know, suspicious of that. So, but Kierkegaard certainly holds Hegel in high regard. 
um, you know, he says Hegel is as far as philosophy is going. You know, Socrates, in ancient times, you read the philosophical fragments. It's Socrates who's being, you know, the counter position to, to you know, Christ. Um, you read Fear and Trembling, and it's, and it's Hegel, right? Hegel's not something bad. Um, it's not like he's doing terrible philosophy. It's just that philosophy understood in that sense can only go so far. Um, so, all right, let's see. J. R. J. Wasser, your video on becoming a philosophy professor was great, but I'm interested in what you might suggest for interdisciplinary students like me who need to make up for lost ground. Um, well, um, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, to begin with, I, I think if you watch the how to you know the video about becoming a philosophy professor, which I shot you know quite a long time ago, you should have come away with the impression that if you are able to become a philosophy professor, a lot of it is really up to luck and being in the right place at the right time and not, I mean, you can, you can prepare, it's sort of a, it's not even really a necessary uh, condition because there are a lot of duds out there who just went to Ivy League schools and got, you know, positions and, and are sort of placeholders where other people ought to be. But um, you can certainly do better for yourself by like, you know, working on, on some, you know, areas that you know are going to be marketable in the job market like applied ethics or something like that and you, you know you should you should develop a broad background we can go in and in, in, uh, on this for for quite a while um but even if you do that there's no guarantee you're going to find a job um other than like adjunct work which you can't sustain for for an entire career because you it's not a livable lifestyle right um so you know you're asking well what do you do to make up for lost ground you got to study the stuff that that you Ideally, would have been able to, to study as a BA or as an MA, um, which means, in my view, um, not just trying to master, you know, the cutting edge stuff, because that's kind of faddish. I mean, right now, people are constantly asking me questions about Deleuze, who, who you know, I find interesting. I don't like his stuff with Qatari quite as much as I like his, his stuff on his own. But um, I'm willing to bet that 10 years from now, we're going through like a Deleuze phase right now. I bet you people are not going to be as interested in him uh, 10 years from now. If it was like 10 years ago, people are much more interested in Levinas and Derrida, and they're not quite as interested in that now. So I would concentrate on, you know, sort of key movements, key thinkers, key schools in the history of philosophy. And you don't have to master them, but you certainly want to know about them. You know, like what what Plato actually taught, and then maybe a little bit about some of the later Platonists. Um, what it is that Aristotle had to say about things. It's not like you have to read every single thing the guy wrote, but it sure wouldn't hurt to know the Nicomachean Ethics. I'll give you a funny example. I was at a um, dissertation defense the other day, and I wrote about this a little bit, I think, in Arexis Dianoetike, my main author blog. Um, I was at a dissertation defense, and the chair of the committee asked the, you know, defense the person defending his dissertation, a question, pretty straightforward question about virtue ethics and Aristotle and pleasure, and the asker and the askee, neither of them had a good answer to it, but if they had read Aristotle recently, just Nicomachean and Ethics books three and four, there would have been an answer right there to their little conundrum. And of course I didn't say anything cause I was in the middle, you know, I'm, I'm a guest at the thing, but you know, if you actually know your ancient philosophy, know some medieval philosophy, know some of the high points of modern philosophy, I think that puts you in a, in a good position. Particularly when it comes to, as you're saying, making up for lost ground. Um, hungry American. Hi, Professor. Do you think Freud is or should be relevant in philosophy? Should he be taken more seriously? Great question. Yes and no. Um, I was just reading Civilization and its Discontents again yesterday. Um, and, you know, it's always pleasant to read Freud in part because he is a great essayist and he has a lot of interesting points to contribute that go beyond Freudianism for philosophy. I, I, yeah, he definitely de deserves to be read. And then he'll come out with something where you're like, oh, my God, I can't believe that, 
people actually took this crap seriously, like the Oedipus complex, for example, you know, um, you know, and, and by the way, somebody like Lacan will say, oh, the Oedipus complex, just one configuration among many other possibilities, not something you find universally in all cultures, you know, whereas Freud was, was insisting on that. And so were a lot of the Freudians of, of the time. Um, in that case, it was, it was, you know, his theory of the stages uh, and, you know, um, stuff about uh, sexuality and, and, you know, you're like, oh, come on, Freud. So there's, there's the aspects of Freudianism where it presented itself as being truly scientific and it dominated the, the um, psychological academy and even, you know, some philosophical stuff for quite a while. And that was sort of like a, you know, buying into a, a dogmatic system. And that stuff, um, most of it probably needs to be rejected. That said, the notion that, you know, um, things that we experience in our childhood could have an incredibly important bearing upon our inner psychic life and, you know, traumas that we encounter, maybe we need to uncover them and work them through. That's a brilliant idea, you know. Uh, it's not unique to Freud, but some of the stuff that he says, uh, supplemented by, by later thinkers, could be quite useful. So, um, you know, and, and, and some of his sort of theory of human nature, I think, is, is quite cool and worth, definitely worth teaching, right? Um, can you bring together Freud productively with some of the other hermeneutes of suspicion like Marcuse does with, um, you know, for example, Freud and Marx? Yeah, you can do that. Um, Sometimes it generates stuff that's not particularly on point, but, but is interesting nonetheless. So, you know, and you think about the wide range of stuff in philosophy and, and a lot of what passes for contemporary continental or analytic philosophy, and you're like, man, three quarters of this stuff is pretty hokey crap. Um, yeah, why not let Freud in there, right? So, yeah, he should be taken seriously. I, I think he should be taken seriously, not in the sense that we should be like, you know, hermeneutes pouring over Freudian text to try to get out every single nugget of information, but I think he, he deserves to be part of the conversation. Uh, Zorba asks, how to get over unrequited love philosophically since a girl doesn't like me because she thinks she's above my league? Well, there you've got half of the, the, the answer in your very question, right? You know that um, it's going to be unrequited. Um, you know that unless you, you believe that like she is the only person for you ever, it's possible for you to feel this affectivity towards somebody else. Why not uh, take a break from that and, you know, try not to think about her and, and, and do something else that's kind of productive with, with your time and your life. And pretty soon you're going to find you're going to run into somebody else who similarly trips your trigger. And then you can hopefully have it not be unrequited and you can, um, you know, find find some person that potentially you could date because they don't think they're they're uh, above your league. You might also think about too, uh, you know, wh what do we what do we count as being above or below somebody's league? You know, we we measure people in terms of like one through ten. You know, what factors go in there? You know, if somebody really is working on this rating scale, I don't know that there's somebody worth dating anyway, right? Um, but, you know, there, there's, there's different approaches that you can take. But I think one of them would be thinking about, you know, what is, what is going to actually make you happy? Um, now, the ancient philosophers and the, and, and the medievals and the moderns, they all knew that this, this desire that we, we call love can certainly be incredibly strong. And um, it's not like you can just stuff it down and repress it. But you don't have to, you don't have to um, give into it. And, and understanding how the emotions work and understanding that it, it doesn't have to drive you in this way, even though that it feels like it does, that can often be quite liberating. All right. Uh, the O'Sullivan Factor. Trying to study German with an eye on reading philosophical texts. Can you recommend any books novels, treatises, short stories to read early on? That's a good question. Um, I mean, somebody I, who I, I enjoy quite a bit, who, you know, you might find interesting, you'll probably need a, like a lexicon to look up some words from time to time, would be, you know, Kafka's uh, short stories, right? Quite philosophically informed. 
um, some really cool themes being raised in them. Um, so, you know, he would be good. He's readable. Um, don't try to read somebody like Heidegger or, or Hegel, you know, right off the bat because uh, tough to read even in the original German because, you know, in Heidegger's case, he's playing around with language. In Hegel's case, he's a terrible stylist, although he's a great thinker. Um, it's just not a, not the clearest writer. Somebody who is quite fun to read but will require you to, to look up quite a few words because uh, he's got a vast vocabulary is, of course, Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche makes up a few words as well here and there, you know, umwerting de, de, uh, de, de Werte. Yeah. Um, you know, the transvaluation of values. Übermensch, of course, right? You know, made up term. Um, but you know, you can you can puzzle your way through it. You know, I, I would I would actually get yourself a copy of the Grimm's Fairy Tales. They're they're fun as hell to read and and not too difficult, I think. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on in them. Um, so you know, if you start out with stuff like that, that that would be quite good. Um, I'm not somebody who really approached my languages in, in as systematic a, a fashion as many people do. Um, so I, I don't know that I have a lot of good advice to give about that. So, all right, William asks, how is your book on anger coming along? Um, very, very, very slowly. How is every book project that I've got coming along? Very slowly. This last academic year, I taught five classes each semester, along with having my usual load of clients and consulting gigs and talks and stuff like that. So I really have not gotten that much done, but I, I'm making a little bit of progress here and there. Um, this summer I'm teaching two more online classes, one of which is starting uh, in a couple days, uh, the other of which is starting in um, early July. So that's going to keep me kind of busy de developing all the stuff for that. That's for uh, Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. I'm teaching an existentialism class. And Marquette University, I'm teaching a business ethics class. But I'm, you know, I'm plowing away at it bit by bit by bit by bit. So it's going to be, it's going to be quite a while. Uh, per, ob per obation, thoughts on William James' Will to Believe. It's a great essay. I actually taught it uh, a couple weeks ago again for my... Milwaukee Area Technical College uh, Intro to Philosophy class. Um, I really enjoy it. It, it, it. The students usually seem, you know, once they get past the verbiage, which is always a difficulty for philosophy, they really seem to enjoy it. You know, I use examples like um, dating, you know. How do you know if you don't go on a date with somebody whether there's somebody you really want to be with? You know, you need to actually sometimes do something in order to figure things out. Same thing goes, by the way, unfortunately, for jobs, for academic institutions. You know, the students can totally relate to this. I say, like, you know, did you did you ever get, like, the, you know, brochures about, you know, what this campus is going to be like and take a tour and all that? Um, that's presenting some truth claims, right? Uh, at least implicitly about what a great college experience you're going to have. Is it really like that? How would you know? Well, you could like ask people who have been there and they might be able to give you some insight, but oftentimes you, you actually got to like, you know, go there and then, you know, it's kind of too late. And it's that way for, you know, a lot of religious experience, you know, I'll, I'll tell you one thing about like, it's something I, I did in the past. I'd like to get back into again. Uh, but I, I haven't done for a while when I was um, really doing a lot of work on St. Anselm of Canterbury, the uh, great, you know, um, uh, 12th century, 11th century to writer, um, I started praying, and I never really did it well, but I started what we call praying the liturgy of the hours. And much of what you're doing there is reciting psalms and other readings and things like that. Um, and you can call it praying or you can call it reading. And this is something that the, you know, uh, sprang up in the, the church. And, you know, by the time that Anselm was doing it, it was a well-established uh, sort of uh, practice, daily practice. It goes on today. Uh, if you hear about people like going to Vespers or 
uh, you know, going to Compline or things like that. That's that's what they're talking about. And I, you know, when I go to St. Anselm College and Abbey, I actually do, do the liturgy of the hours with the monks. And I, you know, I wanted to see, well, what was it like? What sort of effects would this have on a person? The only way to f- figure that out other than reading other people's accounts like in James you know variety of re- religious experience is to actually do it and not to do it in a sort of standoffish like this is all bullshit but let me try it out kind of way um, but to actually like you know be open-minded and, and give it a shot and I found it was it was quite good for me um, it, it was always a challenge to fit it into my day I'm not a good person with time management um, but that's you know that's an example of the sort of thing that James himself doesn't talk about but could have talked about. Um, all right, let's see. Adam Titor asks, "What are the weaknesses and limitations of analytic philosophy, and how do I argue with them?" I spend very little time actually engaging with analytic philosophy, um, especially contemporary stuff, because I, I you know my time is extraordinarily limited. Um, Many of the weaknesses have to do with them not actually having much of a basis in the history of philosophy. They they tend to read very shallowly and and just, just like instead of like picking up a whole book and reading it all the way through. Like for example, right here, here's you know McIntyre's After Virtue. Right? Um, they would be like, well, let me just skip ahead to where the argument is in. Um, chapter here we go in in uh chapter uh 14 the nature of the virtues no you gotta read <laughs> no you gotta read the rest of the book right um because mcintyre himself who knows analytic philosophy very very well came out of that that tradition in part um is it, it's not like the ex- the other pages are just like extra stuff that he threw in there as sort of like an appendix it, it's supposed to be there you know other books his the unconscious where by the way mcintyre going back to the freud thing mcintyre thinks freud is well worth worth talking about when i was in the um uh seminar with him the faculty seminar where i got to meet him and interact with him daily it was uh rational choice theory uh aristotelian Thomism, and freud and lacan that we were studying because he definitely thought freud and lacan were well worth engaging with um, he talks about that, that a little bit, mostly in terms of Winnicott and, of course, his dependent rational animals. Um, so analytic philosophers, going back to that, they're usually pretty poor about, like, when they do anything that's engaging history of philosophy, they only engage a little bit of it. Um, when, they, when they stop doing that and they start really engaging it, like, say, Robert Brandom with Kant and Hegel, they quit being analytic philosophers and they become much more historians of philosophy. Um, I notice they often tend to be rather faddish. We're now in a phase that you can call post-analytic philosophy where they, they, you know, they've split into a whole bunch of different subject areas, most of which are not actually communicating with each other, but they have a common approach of like, let's gonna, let's chart out what the argument is, what the assumptions are. Let's try to make things as clear as possible. And it's a style of doing philosophy, but that's it. It's a style of doing philosophy. They're sort of, you know, stance of i just don't don't understand what these other people are doing is is you know it's hard to take seriously you're you're like either you're posturing or you're just lazy and you haven't read the texts and put put in the time that said you know there's a lot of continental blathering uh i would say three quarters of the continental philosophy i run across in articles is unreadable garbage um but you know that's that's just the, the way it goes you know um, Anonymous asks, uh, I would like to hear your thoughts about how schooling is done. Are you aware of how parts of the Prussian education system made its way into how schools operate? It was designed to make good submissive citizens to do whatever they're told to do. What are your thoughts about that? Um, well, I think we're so far away from that. To begin with, here in America, we do not have a school system. You know, other countries, can you can talk about an educational system because they're much more national, you know, centralized than we are. Here in America, with education, with health care, with prisons, with policing, we have an incredibly localized set of systems. So we have a federal system up on top, right? And that trickles down into other things. And that federal system includes the government, but it also includes big people like 
Bill Gates and Melinda Gates, you know, pumping tons of money into Common Core, things like that, right? And then you have, you know, your theorists who, who also have sort of a national uh, extent as well. Then you have all of the stuff at the state levels. We have 50 states. Every single state is different from the other. Education priorities vary. Education funding varies. What they're doing with education uh, varies considerably from state to state. Then we have local, the county level, right? And each county is its own little animal. Like here in Milwaukee County, this is a very different place than Eau Claire County across the state. Uh, very different needs, very different ideas. Um, and then we have, even lower than that, uh, we'll, we'll have like the school system. And so the school system in, in the same county is not the same thing. We, you know, like here in Milwaukee County, we have the Milwaukee Public Schools, and they're different. You know, there's like the main schools and there's the charter schools, right? And then uh, every other municipality has its own school system. And people often move to be in a different school system because they're doing things differently. Add to that the fact that we have religious schools, right? Uh, and we have other private schools. You know, I went to, for example, uh, um, for middle school, I went to a, a private school that was not religiously affiliated. This makes it impossible to generalize across the board about the American system. Um, I don't think there's much of that, like, we're trying to produce nice worker drones actually going on. If there is, it's not to produce worker drones for the state, but rather for, uh, you know, corporate contexts. Um, so, you know, that, that's pretty much all I guess I have to say about that. Uh, Anonymous has another question. Do I get bored doing AMAs? Do you securely mock us to your colleagues because of the questions we ask? What are your overall thoughts about these AMAs? No, I like doing AMAs. I like, I, I like uh, answering questions. I mean, if, if you've been following me for any time, you know that I actually mock my colleagues an awful lot, and I mock the sort of traditional way of doing college education. Um, I, you know, I was... I was always kind of a insider outsider, even when I was a traditional academic, I thought the way things were done was mostly bullshit. And many of my colleagues were kind of, you know, placeholders who, um, you know, were much more about prestige than about the actual texts and thinkers and, and about teaching and learning. Um, no, I think this is, this is a really important way to, to do philosophy. I, if I had the time, I, maybe I'd do, more of these we'll we'll see down the line you know again i mentioned time management is a big problem for me if i succeed maybe i'll do more events kind of like this um sometimes i'll use questions that come up as uh starting points for doing some writing like in, in my author blog erexis do you know etike um but no, I don't, I don't, I don't make fun of, of people. Sometimes I'll use questions that come up though with my students and I'll be like, here, here's the thing that like, I'll do that with this, like AMA sessions with what's going on on Twitter, what, what comes up on Facebook. And I'll be like, here's, here's something that's um, somebody had to say, let's talk about this. And uh, students like that, you know, cause then they can see that people are actually out there talking about philosophy in the real world, you know? Uh, William asks another question. Um, can I get by with just reading Descartes' Meditations, Hume's Inquiry? Hume has two inquiries, by the way. Kant's first critique and Hegel's phenomenology is that two bare bones. Get by with what? I mean, get by with claiming that you've checked off a bunch of boxes, I guess. But if the goal is to like understand philosophy, where's all your ancient and medieval stuff, right? And, and, why, you know, Descartes' Meditations, Hume's Inquiry, why Kant's first critique? Why not his second critique, which is a lot more accessible and, and probably has a lot more to do with, with your life? And then jumping into Hegel's phenomenology, I mean, this is not a, I don't think that's a viable course uh, for studies. What I would do, you know, actually, if you think this out, what I would do, before trying to go into anything like Hegel or even Kant's first critique, um, you know, read some stuff in ancient philosophy, some of the classic stuff, some medieval stuff, some early modern stuff. And before you're going to read the first critique, read the uh, prolegomena to any future metaphysics. Um, and then, you know, if you're going to read the first critique, go ahead and read it, but don't expect to get that much out of it. Um, you're probably going to get more out of Kant's practical philosophy than his theoretical philosophy. 
And yeah, if you want to take on Hagel, go ahead. I wouldn't start, you know, if I was going to say where to start with Hegel, it wouldn't be the phenomenology. I would say read his lectures on the history of philosophy because then you've got some like hallmarks of people that you know and you can get what Hegel's kind of shtick is and his approach to them and his lectures on the philosophy of history and then maybe read that short piece, Reason in History, and then do the phenomenology, you know? Um all right, let's see who else we got. Uh, we got a lot of questions here. Um, and I just scrolled down for a second. Let's see here. Uh, three by four architecture. Any chance you'd do some lectures on the early Heidegger? Thanks for your ongoing work. I did lectures on the early Heidegger. I did lectures on being in time. That's early Heidegger, you know? That's as early Heidegger as you can get. That's like his his uh, master early work. Um, yeah, I'll do other stuff too. It's a matter of finding the time. Um, that's that's always the biggest problem for me is carving out the time to to get things done. Um, but yeah, so and what what else? The lectures on um, Heidegger's. Well, I mean, what is metaphysics? That's early Heidegger. The other stuff that I have available, like in core concepts, was that stuff on uh, the Plato's allegory of the cave. That's actually later Heidegger stuff. But yeah, I'll get to some 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 other early stuff. But right now, I got to crank out a lot of stuff on existentialism. Uh, other existentialist authors this this summer for this class. Uh, Adam Titor, what are the adequate philosophical views on language? Um, well, there's a lot of adequate philosophical views on language. So I don't know exactly what, what, what you're asking about there. Um, Jack Pick, thoughts on Wittgenstein. Nice segue there. Um, Wittgenstein is an interesting guy. Um, I think his, his conception of language game, quite, quite useful. I, I don't think it's absolutely unique. I think other people were, were, coming up with similar things uh, in the 19th century. Um, and uh, even, even Bishop Barclay was, you know, noting that there were many different uses of language in, in his uh, uh, principles, right? But um, what else? Uh, other adequate views on, on language. I mean, you know, you might actually start, if you want to look at language, you might start earlier on and kind of, work your way backwards. Somebody who I think is particularly good is Umberto Eco. Um, he's got this book, Semiotics and the Philosophy of Language. That's a great place to like get a lot of references for who you want to go back to and read. So that, that could be kind of fun. Wittgenstein, going back to the Wittgenstein thing. So Wittgenstein, uh, I've mentioned this before, I think he's kind of a missed opportunity. I wish he'd read more widely in the history of philosophy because I think his work would have been much, much better in that case. Uh, Sisyphus, have you read anything by Zizek? What do you think about his views on Hegel? Zizek is an all-over-the-map kind of guy. Um, I Zizek is somebody who I find interesting, but I also find annoying uh, quite often, um, because I'm like, you know, I like w when he buckles down and is fairly systematic about stuff. That's the stuff I like to read. Like his, when he was doing early work on, on, you know, um, uh, w really in, in semiotics, uh, some of the early stuff that was, that was quite good in bringing in desire, bringing in these authors. Um, I also like reading Zizek's op-ed pieces, by the way. Um, I don't read his books very often anymore because I don't get that much out of it. Um, I, I, you know, let me put it to you this way. If your goal is to understand Hegel, read Hegel. Don't worry about like what secondary literature, or what, you know, cutting edge exponent you should embrace. Get the Hegel down first and then start reading other people and you can say, oh, yeah, yeah, I think they got this right. Oh, that's really insightful. I didn't see that before in there. Um, that's when you want to go to people like Zizek. Um, Adam, what ideas of Frege were rejected by his successors, analytic philosophers? It depends on which analytic philosopher you're asking about. It's not like analytic philosophy was one coherent school. Um, not everybody bought into his you know, sense and reference thing. Some people did. Some people didn't. 
Um, I mean, Wittgenstein criticizes Frege at certain points himself. So in, in his later works, but I don't, I don't know enough about that. Um, Proham, have you seen Arthur Holmes' videos on YouTube? I, I have not. I don't watch many of other people's YouTube stuff because I, I don't have the time. Chuck Norris, could you explain the difference in nuances between endurance and courage in the Stoic sense? Socrates was said to unite his endurance by spending nights outside. So courage is one of the four virtues, right? And each one of the four virtues, if you read Arius Didymus or Diogenes Laertes or Cicero, some of the other thinkers, Think of it as a basket in which there's a whole bunch of sub-virtues. Endurance, cartea, is one of those sub-virtues. And, and so that, that's it. It's sort of a part-to-whole relationship. Uh, Andrew, first, how fast do you read? Do you think that speed reading is any useful, especially in philosophy? I don't know how fast I read. I, I read at the rate that, it, that the book requires, you know. Um, and a lot of my reading these days is rereading, which is different than originally reading. I will answer the thing about speed reading. I think that speed reading is for idiots. Um, you know, it's useful for technical documents. It's useful for like business text or stuff like that. It's useful for newspapers. If you want to read literature, you want to read philosophy, you want to read any sort of important theory, speed reading is for bros who want to like impress people with how much they've gone through. Because you ask them afterwards about anything that's actually important in the work and they don't know a damn thing, you know. Don't skim. Don't speed read. If you're going to read philosophy, read philosophy. If, you know, I've got Nietzsche's thus far. If this takes you two weeks to get through, then it takes you two weeks to get through it because that's what it takes. Uh, a book is, is, you know, the author engaging you, the reader, by means of language with these great ideas and experiences and stuff like that. And you probably should be prepared to reread, you know, when you're really reading philosophy, it's not like this. It's not like, okay, this page, now this page, now this page, now this page. It's more like, okay, this page, wait, what the hell is that? I got to go back here and check this out now. Oh, oh, I see how they're connected. Okay. Let me figure out where I was. Okay, I'm getting the context. You know, it's, it's not a linear uh, sort of thing. Uh, for the most case. So, all right. Proham, how much do you think we should take from the pre-Socratics like Heraclitus? We have no books remaining. It's difficult to know uh, anything they thought for sure. I mean, what should we take? We should take what we've got, which is not much, right? Um, I, I mean, there were Heraclidians in antiquity. Uh, if anybody was going to claim to be a Heraclidian today, I'd just say that sounds like bullshit to me. You know, I don't know what you're talking about, and you probably don't know what you're talking about either. Or somebody was going to claim to be a Parmenidian, you know, or even a Pythagorean. Well, although with the Pythagoreans, we do have Neo-Pythagorean texts, right? So those you could you could talk about. All right, uh, Lou Clan, any thoughts on Ernst Kassir? He also talks a lot about language differently than Wittgenstein or Heidegger. Yeah, Kassir is an interesting guy. Haven't read him for a long time. Um, he, I, I enjoyed the stuff that I, I read, but I, it's been too long for me to uh, speculate about, about it. Um, I mean, it's not as if Wittgenstein and Heidegger are the only people you can, you can go to. We're, we're fortunate in that we have a wealth of people talking about language, um, you know, including people that we don't usually associate with philosophy of language. Hegel talks a lot about language and the phenomenology in certain points, right? Um, you know, the, uh, the medievals often had a lot to say about language, a lot more than, than we, usually, um, we usually see, you know. So, all right, let's see what else we got here. Um, Abdul says, in 1972, Lester Bangs wrote that Black Sabbath is the first truly Catholic rock group or the first group to completely immerse themselves in the fallen redemption. Do you agree with that hot take? That is a really interesting idea. Um, I mean, Geezer Butler was a Catholic. Well, is a Catholic. He's still alive. I don't know how often he practices, but it really did have a... He's the one who wrote most of the lyrics, too, by the way. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, you know, I, I guess there's a lot of people. So I'm going to go on a bit of a uh, sort of free association might be rant here. There's a lot of people, when it comes to Christianity and metal, I'm only going to talk about metal because I don't know enough about other rock genres to be, you know, helpful with that. 
you know, there was this tendency to like see themes about the occult and sexuality and partying and be like, this stuff is, you know, satanic. This stuff is deliberately, um, you know, hedonistic against, against religion. It kind of depends on how you understand your religion. If, if your religion is vast enough, like, you know, that of say Chesterton or, or, or Lewis or Graham Greene to encompass the human condition as such, then I think the dark parts of the human condition have to be explored. You know, I mean, think about like, so I'm wearing Judas Priest's British steel right here. Right. And uh, the whole, uh, um, you know, metal aesthetic of the motorcycle stuff. It was, it, it didn't only come out of Judas Priest, but, but Rob Helford played a big role. And it turns out that came from, you know, BDSM stuff. Uh, uh, and, and his, you know, the gay subculture that he was participating in, um, you know, is that anything that could be embraced or rethought or examined, you know, assimilated, or do we have to like push that off? Oh, this is all terrible, bad stuff. I think there's a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of uh, religious people who just do that, you know, but I think that there's possible, and then there's there's another thing too. We we you know we say well we can we can adopt this, but for good you know. And then you get bands like Striper and all these Christian metal things, and you know even the genre of white metal, none of which I give a shit about at all. You know I find that stuff really boring for the most part um, because it's sort of like we're going to take this thing that's really vital and has all this potential, and then we're going to superimpose this this you know safe doctrinal thing on top of it and um that'll that'll be good another possibility is you you enter in judiciously and you say wow holy shit there's something going on here and this is really interesting how much of this can we understand can we make sense out of um where do we have to draw lines you know um so that you know that that's a, a viable take i think uh, Austin asks, what do you think of, what do you do about being around people that don't have any reverence for philosophy and how do you put philosophy to practice in those environments? Well, you, you do philosophy without telling the people you're doing philosophy. So like when I work with corporate clients and I'm doing stuff about say anger management, I don't tell them that most of what I'm drawing upon is, uh, coming from Aristotle, the Stoics, Thomas Aquinas, and a few other places, right? Um, they don't need to know that until they start getting interested. And then I'll be like, oh, hey, by the way, here's the bibliography. You want to know more about this? Here's what you might actually read. Um, because, you know, most of the time they're going to be like, oh, I had a philosophy class. It sucked. I don't want to I don't want to be involved with that sort of thing. So that's part of it. You smuggle it in. You know, I mean, the good news is, is that whatever's being done in organizational theory or business theory or communications or education or training and stuff like that is usually such watered down crap that when you bring in some philosophical concepts, it's almost always better than what they're working with, you know? Uh, so you, you've got a bit of an advantage and, you know, you, you apply some of the things that you learn in philosophy, like making distinctions really well without, um, telling people that that's, you're, you're doing that because you're a philosopher until they ask, right? So I think that's part of how you do it. Um, Nicholas asks, most of the videos I've seen from you are on ethics or psychology. Do you have an interest in metaphysics? Yeah, and if you've been watching the channel, I did stuff on Aristotle's metaphysics just a couple months ago. Um, you know, I, I have an interest in, in metaphysics in the broad sense. Um, I would say that, that psychology, ethics, and metaphysics all connect up with each other in, in a large degree. Um, and, you know, I would say that the biggest thing that I do have stuff on is on ethics, but that's in part because I started out recording my ethics classes. And every time I teach an intro class, ethical stuff is a big part of what I'm, what I'm teaching. So I think if you look a little bit more broadly at, at the, the videos that I, I have out there, you'll see, uh, you know, stuff on the will, that's metaphysics. It's not just psychology. Stuff on um, whether God exists or not, you know, that's, that's metaphysics as well philosophy of religion is kind of a sub-branch for the most part of metaphysics. Um, Enrico, any philosophical view on how to avoid procrastination and be a productive person? Well, there's no magic bullet for that. Being able to identify procrastination when you're doing it 
uh, and being honest with yourself, I'd say is the first step. Um, and then, you know, you know, looking at things teleologically can be helpful. Understanding, you know, so, so understanding what, what, what you really want and, and what's needed to get it, the means and the ends that can, it's not going to like make you not procrastinate, but you have to, you remind yourself of that at different points. You're like, listen, I really want to be able to like have a book someday. I need to actually do some writing. Writing is one of those activities where it's really easy to procrastinate. You're like, you know, the, the bathroom could use a cleaning. I better get to that. Oh, what about cooking something for the week? You know, like any, uh, let's do some research and you go down the rabbit hole you, you have to remind yourself of what your end is and what the means are to get it and what will interfere with the means and yourself away from the considerations like, well, if I just do this other thing, this is also a means to the end. You're like, no, no, that's not it. Another thing is to, to you know, remind yourself that if, you, if you're procrastinating, it's probably stemming from a habit. And do you want to strengthen the habit or do you want to weaken the habit and make yourself better off the next time that you're you're dealing with this stuff um, by, by uh, I don't know, like, you know, taking a stand at this point. Um, the other thing is oftentimes procrastination goes along with another P, which is perfectionism. If it can't be done perfectly, I'll do it tomorrow. You know, I won't, I won't work on it today. And so just remind yourself that you can get partial work done on something. And it's better to get something done than than nothing, right? Um, Tom eight. By what criterion do you judge if what a philosopher says is true by argument, but then what intuition, logic? Isn't it just an aesthetic choice, especially when it comes to metaphysical questions? Um, well, there's no one single thing, right? We have to be pluralists when it comes to criteria for for truth and you put them together and you work at it for a long time and sometimes it turns out that you're wrong about it and you revise it um sounds kind of like you're looking for like what's the one thing that i can totally depend on and there there isn't anything like that generally we're we're you know i mean you could say that it has aesthetic elements to it you know that's definitely the case um is it just a purely aesthetic choice i don't think so unless you know unless you're somebody who's like an aesthete, you know, um, and there are some out there. So, um, yeah, Sonus, I live in Athens. Is this your Stoic on too difficult for someone not a well acquainted with Stoicism to understand? Good question. It's the opposite of that. Stoic on is not, uh, this is not an academic conference for academics to get together and talk about, you know, what exactly are the indifference or anything like that. This is a popular philosophy thing meant to introduce people to stoic ideas and practices and be a way for them to network and talk with each other and do workshops. That's the way they've always been. If you, you know, just look at the, the lists of the uh, stoic on stuff that's out there, or, I mean, go to the modern stoicism uh, video channel and watch some of the talks that are on there and you'll see the kind of talks that people tend to be giving. Um, all right, Kaya, will you be doing anything on Marx eventually? I've already done stuff on Marx. You got to you got to check the channel. You you know, use the search function uh, or just put in Google Sadler Marx video and you'll find a sequence of uh, five or six videos that I did on on uh, Marx uh, some time ago for a uh, a class, right? Um, I'll be doing more eventually when I have the time, but that that depends on the time. Uh, as a philosophy, here's Will, as a philosophy major, I've come to lean more towards misanthropy than I once was. Any advice on how to deal with this or should I continue riding this train? Uh, misanthropy is not a great way to go. Um, you know, it's, uh, so what is misanthropy? Hatred of mankind, you know, sort of a, uh, distrust of, of human beings and, uh, looking down upon them, disliking them, you know, not wanting to engage with them. Um, I mean, there are some philosophical points of view that will kind of steer you towards that, but that's not where the vast tradition of philosophy is. I mean, you read somebody like Descartes, Descartes was not a misanthropist, you know, uh, or Hume or Aristotle. These were people who 
loved other people and thought that human beings are really interesting. Even Thomas Hobbes, you know, um, you can say well, he's very pessimistic about human beings. Yeah, but he also wants to fix things, you know, he, and he's writing at a time of civil war, by the way, in his home country. So, yeah. Gabriel, do you think Hegel's theory of conscious history points towards a truly predictive notion of social history? No, not at all. Um, you know, I, I don't think that Hegel had the, the market cornered on the end of history at all. So that's kind of a non-starter, you know. Um, Dakota, have you read Carl Rahner? If so, what do you think about his work? Yeah, we did an entire course on spirit in the world. Um, I'm not that big on Rahner. I, I, I never found him that, that great or insightful. Um, he's kind of popular among liberal Catholic theologians. Um, but I just, I just never really got into him. So, uh, let's see here. Um, here's a, here's a question by Will. Is someone interested in aesthetics? Why is this branch of philosophy seen by some as the odd one out and neglected? Well, I mean, in philosophy, you pick any branch, it's seen by some as the odd one out and neglected. There's some people who are like, even ethics doesn't matter, you know, just metaphysics, just, you know, uh, logic, just this. Um, I don't think that aesthetics is any more on the outs than metaphysics is in some circles um it's it's you know it, it's not a an area where there's um a ton of jobs unfortunately although you know i i have the opportunity at milwaukee institute of art and design if i want to design an ethics class or aesthetics class i probably could i'm just not unfortunately for that job i'm not a, a specialist in aesthetics um, so we'll see if I ever do that. Um, I also think aesthetics is often taught outside of the philosophical establishment, but then a lot of ethics is too, and, you know, a lot of, uh, philosophy of communication and philosophy of technology is so. All right. Written, will we be able to tip or donate to your channel through cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin sometime soon? Um, I don't have a Bitcoin wallet. I, I suppose I could get one, but that would be something I'd have to like set up and, and um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I probably in the future. Um, I mean, I have a friend who's very into Bitcoin stuff and I could get him to help me out with that, I guess. Uh, Alexander Angelovsky, what are your thoughts on Alan Watts? I don't take him that seriously. I think he was sort of a creature of his time. Um, the hippies and, and other new agers these days are really into him because of his spirituality, but it's all kind of, you know, the, the stuff that I read back when I was in my teens and twenties, I never found all that insightful. The people who are like from the religious traditions that he talks about often say he got this wrong. He got this wrong. He got this wrong. So he seems kind of like a, you know, a guy who was really keen on forming connections and was really into like discovering new stuff and wanted to share it. But I, I don't think that that there's any sort of lasting great value to what he's doing. I think a hundred years from now, everyone's going to be like, Alan who? Just like we're like, what, Herbert Spencer, who is he? You know? Um, so, you know, it's kind of cool that, he, that he's got stuff on YouTube that people can watch, but, you know, that's... Uh, yeah, that's about it for him. Uh, let's see. Oh, just skipped a little bit. Um, Andrew Davis, do I have a particular school of philosophy I subscribe to an ism that I believe in, such as Aristotelianism or existentialism? Yes, I have a whole bunch, which means that in a strict sense, I'm not, I'm not any one of them, right? I'm an eclectic. I've, I've mentioned this a number of times. I'm sort of a Ciceronian eclectic, which means that I'm not just doing like, you know, one from column A, one from column B, mix it all up together in a stew, and there we go. It's rather that I study, you know, schools and, and movements pretty extensively, and I'm like, this stuff over here is pretty good, but I'm not going to buy into this part over here. Cicero himself calls himself an academic skeptic, but he's the kind of academic skepticism that he's embracing is clearly eclectic. 
And so I, I, I have a sort of similar thing. I draw on the Platonist tradition with some things, the Aristotelians, the Stoics, some Christian thinkers, some existentialists, some dialectical thinkers, um, you know, some philosophy of language stuff. Uh, what I find useful, I, I, I end up adopting and trying to find ways to make fit. And I can't say that I've, you know, got some sort of like comprehensive synthesis worked out. You know, maybe maybe in my 50s that'll happen. I'm getting getting close. You know, I'm going to be 49 this year. Um, who knows? Maybe that won't happen ever for me. Uh, and that's OK. Then I can be a pluralist like, like William James, you know, um, we'll, we'll see how, how it happens. Um, all right, let's see here. So back and forth between some people discussing stuff. Um, piggy pig. Do I think antinatalism is a good philosophy? I would say it's a good philosophy for antinatalists. You know, it'd be cool if they don't reproduce at all. Um, but no, I don't think a good philosophy, um, you know, better not to be born, all that sort of stuff. I mean, that's been talked about for a very long time. That's the sort of thing that Nietzsche in, in Birth of Tragedy is already like, you know, talking about this will to death and how do we overcome that? These three noble responses, the Dionysian, Apolly, Apollonian, and Socratic. And I, I just don't take it seriously. I, I suppose I should read some classic antinatalist literature someday, but I don't know why people keep asking me about it. You know, um, is it something that, that, that is, getting some real traction. I, I'll spo I suppose I'll have to check on that. Um, Chuck Norris, how can one who seeks to live wholly stoic, stoically find middle ground between adhering and ambitions of career, et cetera, even though value judgments are rewired is the only option to abandon all ambition? Well, that would not be stoicism, actually. That would be Aristo rather than Zeno's approach. Aristo was, um, you know, a guy who was, follower of, of Zeno, but got rid of everything else. He was, he was like, nothing other than virtue matters at all. I mean, the Stoics recognize this entire range of the indifference. If you want to see how Stoics make sense of that, read um, Cicero's On the Ends, book three, where it's laid out pretty clearly. Um, or if you want to read a really great contemporary, but rather difficult uh, treatment of that, read uh, Becker's A New Stoicism. You know, um, the, the indifference do matter. They just don't matter for Stoics in the same way as the good and the bad do, right? They're preferred and, and rejected indifference. So, you know, um, living wholly Stoically would mean taking on that thing. Um, the difference between the, the, the good and the bad, virtue and vice, and the whole realm of the indifference. I mean, Epictetus also tells you, as you, as you well know, if you're attempting to live wholly stoically, he says this in the discourses, uh, that while indifference themselves are neither good or bad and are not really up to us in any important way, uh, our use, our chresis of indifference is completely up to us and is good and bad and does have to do with pro racist So, yeah. Um, Johan asks, uh, I was wondering about neo-stoicism and the idea of uniting Catholicism and stoicism. What's your opinion on it? Um, that's that's an area that I'd like to sp get to spend more time on reading. I've only read bits and pieces of some of the people that are like Lipsius and Charon and um, uh, you know some some of these other which I'm blanking on their names. These other thinkers that are trying to combine um, and, and let's let's not call it Catholicism. Let's call it Christianity, right? Um, they're trying to combine Stoicism and Christianity. There's a long, you know, tradition of that. Um, what are the prospects for it? Uh, it? It really depends on the individual. I mean, Pascal is really down on them, and he knew those guys. Um, he thinks that that Stoicism, and he particularly singles out Epictetus, that they're right in one sense. They they grasp the grandeur of human being. But they don't also they don't also understand the misery of human beings, so they're missing out on something, and uh, they their prescription for humanity is is not something that could be universalized. Um, so it's it's well worth looking into these authors, um, and there there are neo stoic elements to like. Rene Descartes' uh, uh, ethics that you see in the, the meditations, like in, in Meditation 4, 
in his, I mean, he and Princess Elizabeth actually read Seneca's On the Happy Life, or was it on, was it on another thing on benefits maybe? And, and they discussed it together, right? So um, there, there are some important 17th century thinkers who are, are looking very closely at Stoicism. All right, let's see what else we got. Uh, boo, boo, boo. I have no idea how this is supposed to be pronounced. Uh, Olal, Olalo, Olalo. Was the Oedipal complex literal, symbolic, or both? Um, I mean, at best, symbolic, I guess. But like I said, Lacan, for example, says, you know, the Oedipal complex. Freud really insisted on this, but it's it's not something universal. Um, and I think the Oedipal complex, you know, you can say that they're, they're, you can observe dynamics sometimes or there are these family tensions like that, but to universalize it into like a metaphysical constant, I think is kind of kind of nonsense. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, worry too much about it. It's not like it plays an important role in psychology today. Uh, made of clay, what are some philosophers you think are not well known today, but will be well known in the future? Or is it impossible to say? That's a great question. Um, not well known today, but will be well known in the future. I don't know. Um, it's it's so difficult to speculate. This is this is a great question, actually. I I, I wish. This is something I, I, I should give more thought to. Because, you know, you read every back of a book blurb and they're like, this is amazing stuff and this is going to revolutionize this and that. And you can read stuff from like the 70s about, you know, people who are non-entities now. And you're like, well, I guess that didn't happen, right? And you read stuff contemporary, you know, works coming out and you're like, oh, yeah, that, you know, these are people who are quite, you know, prestigious for the moment right now. And then they're just going to disappear once again. Uh, into, you know, like, who who today reads Victor Cousin, right? Um, nobody, uh, except for a few scholars, right? Who who even reads Jaspers? I remember one time going to the Carl Jaspers Society meeting at, at SPEP one year um, because I wanted to see, well, who was actually interested in Jaspers? It was just these five people that all knew each other and struck me as being quite dull, and I never went back again. Um, but Jaspers at one time was like a really major significant name in, in philosophy. I don't know. That's very, very difficult to, to say. Um, Diogenes the Cynic, what do you make of speculative realism? Um, I don't pay very much attention to it. Um, I've seen Graham Harmon talk, and what he was saying was kind of interesting, but didn't strike me as being, you know, super original or you know uh groundbreaking or anything like that and i don't know the other people involved in it well enough to really say much about it so we'll, we'll see if it has if it continues to have legs um or if it becomes a little you know backwater with its own little society and, and stuff like that um yeah i was a little disappointed actually meeting Harmon, unfortunately uh, somebody who's as interested in Lovecraft as, as, as he is, you know, I thought, I thought I'd see more. Um, Gambrick, do I agree with Hegel's criticism of, of Schilling, of uh, Schelling maybe? Um, like in the phenomenology where he's, he's uh, rejecting like intellectual intuition. Do I agree with it? Yeah, I don't, I don't buy into intellectual intuition, but um there's, there's not that much to, to say about it. I, I, you know, I, actually, there is something to say about it. People ask me questions about, like, mysticism as well. Unless you can actually articulate something, I'm not very interested in it. You know, I, I don't want to hear about, like, the ineffable or the thing that you just have to have the experience of um, without, you know, somebody describing it and say, oh, you just got to do it, man. Uh, no, I want to hear a little bit of what, what the doing is like and what you experience. So I, I think that's that's part of it. Um, let me see if I can make sense out of this question from N. Soluan. I study philosophy at uni. I love it, but I am afraid not to like philosophy in the future. Have you ever thought like this when you were a student? You're afraid that like your your viewpoint on philosophy is going to change? And you're not going to enjoy it anymore. 
Um, well, I mean, that could happen. You, you certainly will experience cases where you were really into a philosopher or a way of approaching things, and then you kind of grew out of it. Like I, you know, I've gone through a lot of different phases that I've, I've done videos on and, you know, where I was like super, super, super into this. And then I, I got out of it, but that's not the same thing as like no longer loving philosophy. You get out of it and go into something else, you know, and it's okay too, by the way, to have fallow periods where like you're, you're just not into reading philosophical texts for a while. Um, that'll happen at, at certain points in your life. You know, your life is not just you know, being a student, you've, you've got all these other aspects, relationships, you know, as you age, new things come on the scene. You have to have a job. Um, all right, let's see what else we have. Um, Damon, reading Paul and the Stoics, any thoughts there? I've read the comments, similar beliefs with similar categories. I, unfortunately, I I had a, I took out a copy of Paul on the Stoics because we were going to discuss it, me and, and one of my uh, tutor, uh, tutorial students, and uh, got recalled, you know. Uh, I went to the Marquette Library and I had it and I, re I was able to read the introduction and then it got recalled. And of course, if you don't turn in a book, they freeze your account. And so I had to like go back and give it back to the, to the library. Um, so I haven't read enough about, about it uh, Trolls, uh, what is it? Uh, what is it? Trollsberg? I, I don't remember the the author. Um, let's see here. Ava, how can we get over the tension between the right and the left in current times, and with regards to the current global issues? I don't know. Um, I don't think we will. Unfortunately. I think these are, are so much a part of our cultural system. It's not just about like economic, uh, uh, you know, classes clashing with each other. It's, it's so much a part of our cultural system. And at least here in America, so many people are, are investing so much of their psychic energy in being on the left or being on the right. And, you know, the other side being just complete assholes or morons or bastards or whatever that um, it's, I don't, I don't see a way we're going to get past it unless we have some sort of major catastrophe and then, then all bets are off, right? Um, and even then, it might not, not really fix things. Um, Jakub, what is the point of presenting the philosophical ideas in the Republic in the form of dialogue and myth? Well, those are two totally different things, right? Um, dialogue, why not present things as dialogue? Um, Dialogues are, are a way of having, you know, a living conversation going on that you could jump into. So Plato does that for most of his works, and many other people wrote dialogues. Aristotle, by the way, wrote dialogues. We just don't have any of them, and uh, so, did, so did quite a few other people. Um, you know, Cicero writes, writes some pretty great dialogues. Anselm of Canterbury writes dialogues. Um, why not write philosophy in the form of dialogues? Now, myth is a bit of a different thing. Why, why have mythological accounts in the middle of a purportedly rational account? Well, when you see Plato bringing it, it's usually because we've exhausted the rationality part, and now he's suggesting a possibility. And he's saying, oh, I heard the story from these priests that X, Y, Z, maybe things are like this. And so you use the myth as kind of a starting point for your thinking, but it's, it's, it's not, you know, it, it's a possibility. It's not something that he's absolutely committing himself to, um, something that makes a good story, which is what mythos means anyway, story, right? Um, all right, let's see. Uh, Nick Boline, what do I think of Walter Kaufman's take on Nietzsche? <clears throat> reading it between Zarathustra and beyond good and evil. I think Kaufman is an interesting uh, interlocutor to take into account. Um, I would say I was, I was back when I was like in my early, you know, uh, graduate years, I was much more influenced by Kaufman than by other commentators. I used to get in this argument all the time with this, this guy who became a, a buddy of mine. 
because he had studied with Stanley Rosen. So of course he, he, and he was kind of a follower type. So he like bought into Rosen's take on Nietzsche hook, line and sinker. And I'd counterpose kind of a, a more Kaufman esque approach. Also, you know, one that, that was coming out of the other people that I was reading too, like Louis Ferdinand Celine. And, and uh, I was, I was very down on the possibility of, getting anything remotely political out of Nietzsche. Um, so it is more about like, you know, self-transformation. And um, I will say this, you know, there's a tendency to try to, especially on people on the left, to try to defang Nietzsche or domesticate Nietzsche and turn him into something that would be, um, if not necessarily, you know, uh, no longer, you know, you don't, you don't want a Nietzsche who's actually like going to be harnessed by the anti-Semites and the fascists because he thought they were idiots, right? And he says so quite clearly, um, and other nationalists. But you also don't want a Nietzsche where it's all just about metaphor and rhetoric and self-discovery man or any sort of, sort of stuff like that. Because there is, you know, there is a hard edge in Nietzsche. Uh, he does believe in elites. He does believe in, in, in exploitation and domination. He does think that we have a genealogy that we can trace back that has cruelty at its roots in so many places. Um, so, um, all right. Uh, die. Are the ancient Greek texts more valuable just because people spend more time on them? No. The people spend more time on them because they're valuable, because there's content there. Um, and I don't know what you mean in comparison to more valuable than what? More valuable than, you know, the newspaper, more valuable than texts from other countries. Um, you'd have to, you'd have to specify what you mean there. Um, Mies Mistian, could the question posed by Augustine in the first page of the confessions, which is more important to cry help from God or to know him be seen as the position taken by Kierkegaard and Hegel? Um, no, Kierkegaard is interested in knowing God. Um, Hegel's interested in, in knowing God. They're both interested in, in like, being connected with the divine, which you could interpret as help. Um, why not look at this in terms of, you know, the development of Christian philosophy where you got these two at, at sort of antipodes from each other, but, but both part of the same, you know, broad current of Lutheran developments of Christian philosophy. I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to schematize it quite in that way. Um, achromatic tonalism have I gotten a spirit of trust yet? I have not, and I'm not even sure what that is. Uh, let's take a look real quick. Um, oh, Brandom's book, no. Uh, I have not done that. Um, I did get to go to Brandom's uh, Aquinas lecture uh, where he was um, talking quite a bit about how he's, you know, how he's interpreting Hegel. That was a lot of fun. Um, oops, let me bring this back up and, uh, I gotta, since I shrank this, I gotta close some of the account or some of the, uh, tabs to be able to read the stuff from all of you. Here we go. Um, let's see. No name. A good thing about languages is just how many contact points are possible. You can immerse yourself. Okay, that's not a question. Yeah. Um, Andrew uh, says, uh, I've been binge watching your videos. I'm feeling down. I wouldn't say depressed, but I'm not happy. I can't remember the last time I was. Any advice? That's a good question. Um, I, I Yeah, I, I, any advice? I would say think about, you know, the last times that you were happy, what, what were you doing? What were you experiencing? What was going on? Um, and then, you know, try to not necessarily recapture that, but, you know, try to get partial elements of that and, you know, maybe start out with pretty small things like, you know, on a, on a cold rainy day, like the one I'm looking up at our skylight right now that, that you've got, um, you know, make yourself a nice, whatever it is you like to drink and, you know, light a couple candles and snuggle together, uh, with, if you've got a pet under a blanket and read some decent stuff or watch a challenging show or listen to some, some good music, just, you know, that can sometimes 
help to kickstart things, you could say. Like I, you know, I like to listen to um, metal stuff, but I also like a, quite a bit of classical stuff. I particularly like Satie and Debussy and, uh, you know, Prokofiev and, and uh, a few other, uh, Bach, you know, Bach is good for that sort of thing as well. Um, and it's okay to feel melancholy and happy at the same time. That's, that's often natural for some people. All right. Uh, Astrolect, what is your opinion on the to begin school of plate platonic studies? Um, attempts at reconstruction of the unwritten doctrine. Are you familiar with it? Vaguely. I mean, I don't buy much about, I don't, I don't buy the esoteric exoteric thing to begin with. Um, I think that a lot of that is maybe there could be something to it, but it, it's sort of like speculating about the aliens on the other side of the moon. You know, nobody actually knows. And you got to make so many assumptions just to get anything off the ground that um, it, it usually ends up being kind of circular. And I, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in reading Plato, thinking about what's actually there in the text, what I can draw out of that. Um, same thing with any other author. I, I'm not interested in the books that Nietzsche didn't write. I'm not interested in, you know, the books that, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, pick whoever you like. Um, the books that they they were hinting at doing but never had got to. Um, so, uh, Antarctica, do you have any tips on finding nearby philosophical events? That's a great question, too. Yeah. Use your social media, right? Uh Facebook, if you set your settings right, will alert you to events that are in your area, right? And you can actually like do a search uh, on that. Um, there are all sorts of event sites out there like Eventbrite and Eventsy, you know, and they, they will list things as well. Look in your local, um, you know, city or town uh, pages you know, like we have here, we have On Milwaukee and the Shepherd Express and, you know, uh, New Milwaukee and stuff like that. And people like me put our events into those pages when we have the time. Meetup.com, right, is another thing. You can look on there. Um, when it comes to, like, Stoicism, go to the Stoic Fellowship page and see if there's a Stoa near you, which there ve very well might be. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that you can do. I would actually take your, your local city and just, you know, uh, type your city name, philosophy, and see what comes up. You should also, like, check out any, you know, local universities or colleges and get on their mailing list for philosophical events. Um, those, those are all things you could do. All right. Um, David Fusilier. Do I think there would be a value in a layperson working through philosophical works and blogging their thoughts? I hesitate since I've never had a in real life class in philosophy. Sure. I mean, there's, you know, think about this. Some of the great philosophers that we studied didn't have, an, you know, a class in philosophy. They studied it on their own and then they wrote about it. And um, there's all sorts of really interesting stuff being done by people who didn't necessarily get to go to college and study philosophy. And even if you're blogging and, and not too many people are reading it, I mean, not that many people even read my author blog, um, that's, that's okay. You know, you're sort of charting out your own, your own views on things and working out your thoughts. You might get a little bit embarrassed about them later, but that's okay. I mean, I look back on some of the papers that I wrote, like as an undergrad or graduate student, I'm like, holy crap, this is bad. <laughs> You know? But that's okay. That's part of the, that's part of the process, right? Um, it's not anything that you have to cover up. Um, Silver Shadow, do I have any experience with or opinion of the B. Phil Oxford's master program in philosophy? No. I, I mean, I'm pretty distrustful of elite universities. I think that they're mostly about creating, you know, diplomas and titles and stuff like that. I would actually have to look at the program and who's involved in it and what they have you do and stuff like that. Um, I think you can get just as good of a philosophical education at, you know, your local state school as you can at Harvard or Oxford or anything like that. Um, much, much of that is just prestige. Um, and, and fortunately a lot of that is, is, uh, 
slowly dissipating. I mean, when I hear when I hear somebody brag about London School of Economics or Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard or Yale or University of Chicago, you know, I usually look at the person and I'm like, well, what have they done? Is is it stuff that's any good? I'm listening to their paper. Is is their paper any good? Well, that's another stuffed shirt from uh, an elite university who doesn't actually have anything to say. And that's usually about half the time, right? And I do the same thing, by the way, with anybody from a state school or, you know, a smaller private school. You know, half of them are full of crap, half of them aren't. Um, you don't want to be what you call a respecter of persons, you know. Uh, you want to evaluate these things one at a time. So I, I don't know anything about that. Um, all right. Let's see here. By Aragon 13, if Augustine is the titan of the West, who do you think would be comparable for Eastern Orthodoxy? I don't know. Um, Chrysostom? Uh, Gregory of Nyssa? I don't, I don't know. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that Augustine is the titan of the West anyway. Um, I think that Ambrose and Gregory the Great and, you know, Jerome and, the, you know, Cassian and these people are important. I don't, I don't buy into the, like, the big man theory of, of history for uh, intellectual history anymore than I do for political history. Um, you know, Augustine's important, but I don't, I don't know that he's, like, you know, the titan of, of that sort of thing. Uh, let's see, what else? what else do we have here? Let's scroll down a bit. A lot of back and forth here. Diego Tinico, are you a feminist? Um, yeah, I guess you know it depends on the definition of feminism that you give. If if you have something that where it's about equality and not just merely equality of opportunity, but generating the possibility for opportunities, the way that say Mary Wollstonecraft uh, was was charting out, then yeah, I'm a feminist. And I also you know. I also think that we have some systematic imbalances when it comes to safety, security, um, you know, treatment. I mean, I, I know, for example, this is completely stupid stuff that I'm going to get uh, better uh, evaluations than my female colleagues, not because I'm necessarily a better teacher, but because there's an imbalance. Female uh, professors get worse evaluations in general when they do exactly the same things. So, you know, there's, there's there's a lot of things where I'm like yeah I'm 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 into that and some of it stems from the you know same same reason I'm you know I'm an anti-racist right I I believe in justice um, and I think there is one human race and I think that we should make it possible for as many people as possible to fully develop themselves regardless of where they came from um, or you know what what sex or gender or orientation or national background or race or linguistic group or, you know, pick whatever you want. I'm, I'm, you know, I think that those, those sort of arbitrary uh, distinctions shouldn't be what's determining how we, how we treat people. Um, there's, you know, there's going to be great people and there's going to be complete assholes among any group that you pick. Um, and so I'd like people to be treated like Martin Luther King says, based on the content of their character. So I think that makes me a feminist of sorts. I, I don't buy into the like everything is patriarchy, um, you know, sort of sort of like excessive stuff. Um, but I think there's a lot to be done in in the present circumstances. So you know, and I you know, for example, I'm I think abortion is a, is a, a bad thing in general. But I also look at like the recent laws that have been passed down in the South that are clearly just purely misogynist political posturing. And I'm like, man, I am almost like tempted to be on the other side, you know? Um, so there, there's a lot to be, a lot to be said about that. I don't talk about it myself as a feminist because frankly, you know, I've, I've got a bad taste in my mouth from going all the way back to the nineties of all these guys who'd posture as feminists who definitely weren't because they treated women like crap. Um, you know, but I, I think about the world that I, you know, see ahead of me and do I want equal opportunities for my daughter? Hell yeah. And, you know, do I want her to be, or my, my female students in my classes, do I want them to be able to feel as safe walking on campus or walking down the street or going out on a date as my, my male students? Of course, you know, and are there real life obstacles to that? Yeah. Um, 
it's not generated by every single man or all culture or anything like that, but there's definitely some stuff to call out. So, yeah. Um, Douglas Struthers, should we nationalize the banking system? I guess it depends on what you mean by nationalize. Um, I'm really attracted to the idea of having a European style uh, post office that allows banking for for the poor and middle class. If that's what you call nationalizing it, sure. Um, do you mean like should we nationalize the companies that are out there and say, hey, we're taking you over, Chase Bank? Um, I, I don't know that I'd be for that. Uh, I'd have to look at that a bit more. Uh, Caesar Augustus, who is the most underrated philosopher in your opinion that more people should read? Um, right now, I would say Cicero. There, there's still this prevalent conception that Cicero was just kind of a derivative thinker. No, he's doing some pretty amazing stuff. Oh, it's already 1.32, and I, I have to get to walking the dog um, and uh, get back to grading, so I'm going to have to cut this short. Let me see if there's anything I can go out on real quick. Uh, do, do, do. Okay. There's a lot of back and forth chatting in there. Um, let's see here. Um, boy, there's a ton of stuff here. Um, there's just skipping around all over the place as well. Um, God, there's a lot of back and forth between all of you discussing e each other. Um, oh, here, let's, let, here's a good one. This is from Alex Jensen. Any thoughts on the American pragmatist tradition? So I went to a university for my graduate school where uh, it's one of the very few ones in America, ironically, where there were a lot of representatives of the classical American uh, pragmatist tradition and American philosophy more broadly, which includes the transcendentalists and, and uh, um, you know, the uh, uh, Jonathan Edwards and people like that as well. So the American pragmatist tradition, I really like William James and I really like Josiah Royce and uh, Charles Sanders Peirce. I think they have a lot of interesting things to contribute, well worth studying. I'm not as big of a fan of John Dewey in part because I had so much Dewey shoved down my throat when I was in graduate school, mostly by people who I considered to be at best second rate, you know, thinkers. I even, I even worked for the, the Dewey Center for a semester uh, doing research for them. Um, but, you know, there, there's some things that are worth checking out in, in Dewey. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there's other pragmatists who aren't quite as well known. I think it's, it's a, uh, it's one of those sort of things where I wouldn't ever become a pragmatist, but I think that as an eclectic, there are some things that I could take from them that I, I really like. You know, I, we mentioned like talking about William James' essay, The Will to Believe. I think that's great stuff. Put that together with the Pascal who he's referencing and some other thinkers, you know, and you get, you get some really cool stuff. So, um, well worth reading. I would stick with, you know, the, the big three early ones, uh, Royce, uh, uh, James, and, and Peirce, and then leave the Dewey for later if you're really interested in that sort of thing. But it's, it's, it's worth, stuff that's worth digging into. Then again, so is the transcendentalist tradition. So is Jonathan Edwards. There's some really great American philosophers out there. So, all right, I'm going to leave you on that. I got to go walk the dog before I got to do yet another thing and yet another thing and yet another thing. Thanks for all of the questions. I'm sorry for the ones that I wasn't able to get to, but you know how, how it goes with these sorts of events. And I will see you at some of our like philosophy pop-ups and other online events, including the, remember the, the Aristotle uh, self-directed study tips and things like that coming up next weekend, which I still have to shoot by the way. So see all of you in the ether somewhere and uh, have a great 
morning or evening or whatever it is where, where you happen to be.